Welcome to the Henry Street Church of Christ Wednesday night Bible class. As always, you are our honored guest, and we are elated and we're thankful to have you in the midst of us tonight in our virtual uh, Bible class via Facebook Live. Uh, as always, it's an honor to have you here, but it'd be an even greater honor to have you visit us uh, in person. Uh, our address in Northeast Alabama is 309 Henry Street in the city of Gaston, Alabama, USA. 35901 is our zip code. And you can also find us very easily at www.henrystreetchurchofchrist.com. Uh, though we're still in the pandemic of the coronavirus, we are taking safety measures in order to be able to worship in spirit and in truth and in person uh, without spreading the virus. So we do meet on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Central Time, but we get there at 9.30 because we check temperatures and make sure that we're spread out appropriately uh, throughout the building to make sure, again, we're not too close to each other and we're not spreading uh, the virus, but still being able to spread love and be able to Worship individually and collectively every Lord's Day as the good Lord sees fit. So we're looking forward to seeing you uh, when you grace our presence in Northeast Alabama. Again, at 309 Henry Street, City of Gaston, Alabama, USA, 35901. And you can easily find us more information on the church building, uh, things related to God's word and on our website at www.henrystreetchurchofchrist.com. But I also want to let you know of our other way of being able to uh, participate with us. Uh, we do have our website. And as you can see on your screen, you can see my picture. When you look up my name, Anthony L. Norwood, uh, the humble servant there in, in the ministry at the Henry Street Congregation. And my name on YouTube is Jesus is Lord. And of course, as you know, if you're used to using YouTube, when you first come to our page or any page, you come to the front page, the home page. And you'll see the last five videos that were made. And of course, uh, you can watch all of those videos. But we also ask you to subscribe to the channel so that you're able to uh, get the alerts every time you log into YouTube of when we publish videos. Uh, but we do publish videos every day. Uh, the major publications are on Wednesday, uh, act actually within 24 hours, meaning our Bible study on Wednesdays. We post that the next day on YouTube uh, within 24 hours. Sunday, we also, per uh, we also post our worship service uh, there that you can get that as well. And we do that within 24 hours. I mean, we try to do it the same day, but within 24 hours, just in case. Uh, but also, don't forget our daily broadcast. Uh, we have our daily devotional called One Minute Inspirations, which literally are uh, inspirational message, daily devotionals that we send out every day. And you can be a part of that, too, by subscribing to our, our channel for some upliftment, some encouragement, some instruction in the Word of God, again, in a minute or less each day. And you'll see that uh, it'll make more sense here when you look at our categories that we have available on our YouTube site. Um, basically, uh, categories are called playlist on YouTube. And we have over 600 videos because we've been doing this for about five years now. Um, but we do make it where you can not come into an environment of chaos, but one of organization. So we classify our videos in several different uh, playlists, meaning categories. Uh, as you can see, you have the One Minute Inspirations. That's our daily devotional. We put those there every day for you. Uh, but also the study that we have tonight, the Gospel of John, as we go through a book of the Bible, verse by verse. Um, and we're going to be doing that tonight as we're going to study tonight uh, the Gospel of John, part 39. And the subtopic topic being Jesus heals a blind man on the Sabbath, part three. Time permits, we'll conclude that story tonight. It's full of uh, meat, uh, full of the treasures of God's word uh, in that chapter. And of course, that entire book of the Bible. But as you can see, our other playlist, many categories, got uh, things that deal with science and the Bible, creation versus evolution, in other words, family, things specific for the family, topics that is, social issues, that's politics, society, how things change and how things affect the church, as well as us individuals. 
Sound doctrine is a category that's dealing more with the fundamentals, the elementary elements of uh, the Christian faith, marriage, divorce, and remarriage, the afterlife, etc. Uh, we have, I believe it's 16 different categories there uh, for you to study at your own pace. Technology is so good that you can get these things on your phone or your laptop. You know, if, if you're able to do so, take a break on your lunch break and study the Word of God via video or uh, you're sitting in a bus station or you're sitting at the airport, you can do all those type of things as well. So we're in an age where God can communicate to our hearts very easy, very quickly in 24 hours, seven days a week. So let's take advantage of these things. But also, not only do we ask you to subscribe to the channel, but we also ask you to like and share these videos because the more popular you make these things, the easier it is uh, for others to find these videos. That's just the way it works. Popularity makes a huge difference on YouTube and other social media platforms. So we ask the church to support it, not for vainglory's sake, but for the fact that we are able to share the word of God, uh, encourage other Christians as well as win other souls through electronic means uh, in this day and age as well. But we'll move on and we'll get into the word of God here. But remember that and keep that under your hat as well as we say uh, so that we can use those electronic resources for our own growth and for the growth of others we, we are able to touch in this world. But let's go back to John chapter number nine. And now we're starting at John chapter nine, verse 19 to verse number 23. And as always, we study the Bible the right way. In other words, we study the entire thought of God on a topic. Then we go back and look at individual verses or a couple of verses at a time so that we don't make mistakes because if we just pick a verse here, a verse there, uh, we can easily jump to conclusions that God's word is actually not teaching. So you don't want to separate uh, a couple of verses from what we call the context. The, in other words, the entire thought of God on a topic. So that's why we're going to read it all the way through. Then we'll go back and look at the details. So again, reading out of John chapter 9, verse 19 to 23 out of the King James Version, it reads as follows. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, whom ye say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. Continuing on, verses 22 and 23 say, These words spake his parents, because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore said his parents, He is of age, ask him. Again, that was a rereading of John chapter number 9, verse 19 to verse number 23. All right, now let's look at these verses, verse by verse, or a couple verses at a time. Again, verse 21 and 22 says, and we're going to break this down in our own uh, everyday language. It says, but by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. Now here... The parents of the formerly blind man. Remember, Jesus had already healed him. Now, the parents of the formerly blind man were afraid of the Jewish leadership. So they were scared at this time. Remember that everybody was already said to be kicked out of the synagogue if they confessed Jesus to be the Christ, the Messiah. It's another word for that. Or as we say in our day and age, the Lord and Savior. And so they were feared that they would be ostracized. In other words, cut off from being able to go to the house of worship, which was the synagogue at the time. Because remember, we're in the pre-crucifixion days where the Jewish people, the people of God at that time before the crucifixion, worship in the synagogues. Okay. All right. Now, the Jewish leadership made it known again that if anyone confessed Jesus as the Messiah, he or she would be banned from the synagogue. Again, John chapter 9, verse 22. Thus they gave, and we're talking about the parents again, of the blind man that now can see. They gave just enough information to keep this accusation from being lodged against them. In other words, they didn't want to look like they were followers of Jesus Christ. So they just gave enough information to feed the Jewish leadership without the Jewish leadership coming to the conclusion that they were followers of Jesus so that they would not be kicked out of 
In other words, excommunicated from the synagogue. Okay, continuing on. One of the things that the parents did do, they did tell the truth. They confirmed that their son was born blind. So again, that's one of the greatest things about Jesus' miracles. They were the type of miracles that could not be denied. This man never had sight. So we knew that if he could see now that nothing but a God sent miracle had to occur in order for him to be born blind. So it's not like uh, a lot of these, these shaman, I call them, or uh, witch doctors that are posing as preachers that believe they're doing um, miracles when they really are frauds. Um, because in this case, you know, if, if somebody was to heal a blind man today, they better take a blind man that was born blind. And then people will believe that they're truly doing a miracle, but you rarely see anything like that, if at all. Uh, so we know that in this case, Jesus was no shaman, no witch doctor, no fraud, because he healed a man who had started off that way, being born blind. Okay, now going back to the parents of the blind man that now can see. Now, they would not tell as to how the man was healed. Uh, instead, they put it shamefully, they put their own son at risk. Okay. They basically betrayed their own son by sending the Pharisee back to the son for questioning. So they weren't standing up for their son at all. As we like to say today in our own language, in our um, symbolic words or colloquialism, whatever we want to call that word, but uh, we use here in the United States, they threw their own son under the bus. Okay. And that's very, very shameful to preserve their social status or whatever you want to call it and their ability to remain worshipers at the synagogue, they put their son at risk instead of themselves. All right, so let's continue on. Going to verses 24 and 25, does everyone understand what we've uh, talked about thus far? And we're going to move on to John chapter 9, verse 24 and 25. Okay? All right, give me a chance to respond. If you didn't understand something, we'll move on. Just give you a minute or so. All right, we'll go on. John chapter 9, verse 24 and 25 reads, out of King James Version. Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know that whereas I was blind, now I see. All right, what's going on here in verse 24? It says, then again, called they the man that was blind and said unto him, give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. Now, unfortunately, evil men will pretend to love God when they do not. Okay, these Jewish leaderships were inferring that by the formerly blind man proclaiming Jesus as a sinful person, this would bring praise to God the Father. In other words, they were trying to uh, turn the man's opinion of Jesus into Jesus being somebody that was not holy. Okay? Now, this is even true today. There are many pretenders even in Christianity today. Many people praise God with their lips, but their hearts are not with him. Now, Jesus made this plain in Matthew 15, verse number 8, that this is a strong possibility for the hearts of mankind to engage in. In other words, they can act like they're holy, but they really aren't into God like they seem to be. They can put on airs, they can pretend, they can fool other people. But one thing we know that they cannot and we cannot fool God by any form or fashion. So look at it for a minute here. And this, this is a principle that all must keep in mind that we are not to worship in a way to try to uh, please and impress people. People should be the last thing on our minds, but our worship is designed to please God and impress him instead. So God knows when we're sincere and when we're being fake or phony, if you will. Look at Matthew chapter 15, verse number eight. And Jesus talked about this. He says, this people draw off, this people draw off nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So obviously then God can be very disappointed with the worship of many people because they are just going through the motions or they're 
really not a friend of God at all. They're just doing, you know, making it sound as if they're praising God, but in their heart, they can care less. You know, they could easily be thinking about, oh, I, I want worship service to get over with, you know, because I got other things to do. That's not worshiping in spirit and in truth. That means one's heart is not into what they're doing. Or they're saying as they sing something or they're listening to the word of God, I don't believe this, so forth and so on. So when that is the case, then what God is showing us that their heart is not in what they're doing. They're just going through the motions and not really sincere about what they're doing. God doesn't accept that kind of worship. That's vain worship. He's not pleased with that mentality. Okay. Remember, God knows the hearts of all men. And thus, we must be sincere at all times. Furthermore, be mindful not to get discouraged with hypocrites in the church. They are there. Um, I hate to say that, but it's the truth. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 21 to 23, and I'll just highlight Matthew 7, verse 21. That's why he said, not, everybody, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Remember, he said, many will say, I did this, I did that, as I paraphrase it. And then he's going to say down in verse number 23 of Matthew 7, verse 20, 20 uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 23, uh, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. In other words, Jesus knows who's real and who's fake in the church. And that's why, again, we have to have our hearts 100% devoted to him in everything that we do so that we are a sheep and not a goat to him using the metaphors or using the symbolism of the judgment day in Matthew 25, 31 to 40, uh, where he is surely uh, judging us by our hearts of what's, what we're really about. And remember, Revelation 20, 11 to 15 also talks about the judgment day. We all must stand alone at the judgment day, just between you and Jesus, me and Jesus, and he's going to determine whether heaven or hell is going to be our home. So again, you can't fake it because it will follow you to the judgment day. Be real with God and God will be real with you. Also keep in mind, we cannot let anyone derail our faith or take our faith from us because they will not answer for our shortcomings. The only one who's going to answer for our shortcomings is ourselves. As we know, again, we said we're going to stand alone at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ at the end of days in Revelation 20, verse 11 to verse number 15. All right, let's continue on uh, with this. Remember, we're still analyzing the statement, verse 24. Then again called they the man that was born blind. Excuse me, let me say it right. Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. Now, remember this. Now, we're talking about the false holiness of the Jewish leadership. Jesus exposed to us the true father of the Jewish leadership of the time, which was the devil. We studied that back in John chapter 8, verse 44, where God tells us that uh, Satan has children in this world, too. And the Jewish leadership was a part of that at the time. See, again, a false holiness will never save anyone. Now, regarding the formerly blind man's response, he was being sarcastic when he said the following in John chapter 9, verse 25. Uh, he said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Now, we know that he was being sarcastic with them because this uh, formerly blind man that now can see, he will later show them that he believed Jesus to be a righteous man due to God doing miracles through him. Okay? All right. So let's continue on with our lesson. Now, any questions or comments or anything before we move on? I'll give you a quick moment to respond. Then we'll move on to the next grouping of uh, uh, verses. Okay, seeing no responses, then we'll go on to John chapter 9, verse 26 and 27 that reads, Then said they to him again, What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore, would you hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? All right, let's look at these two verses. Here the Pharisees were trying to make the formerly blind man change his testimony. So again, they're still working on him and trying to get him to change what he has said. However, the blind man, we have to give him credit here, he did not change his story. 
He stood firm on the truth that Jesus healed him. Okay, they were not going to sway him from this fact. So this man was a man of integrity. He stood his ground against some very powerful people. Okay, now he further, now this is the man I can see now that was formerly blind. He responded with further sarcasm with the statement, will ye also be his disciples in John chapter 9 verse 27. In other words, this was as if he was saying, your interest is very strong in Jesus. Since you keep inquiring about him, you must be persuaded to become one of his followers. You know, I don't know how the, the Pharisees would have reacted, but I can only imagine if this was today, uh, they probably became red in their face. You know, they probably became, you know, pretty angry with this man by the way that he's talking back unto them. Okay. And not really bowing down to them just because of their position or their authority at the time, because he was a person, you know, he was a person of integrity. Doesn't look like he cared if power was standing in front of him. You know, it's kind of like um, our saying also we say in the US here, USA here today, especially in a lot of all the political things that we've gone through in the last few years. This man was speaking truth to power. So he was being very, very brave in how he's responding to these very powerful men being the Jewish leadership. OK, now, again, we commend the man for standing up for the truth. You see, all Christians, this guy is, a, is an example for us, a good example. All Christians must have this type of determination in order to be saved. So let's imitate him. Speak power of the truth. You know, stand up for Christ. Uh, because at the end of the day, he is the one that is going to give heaven or hell our, our, our nod. You know, uh, assign us to where our final destination is going to go. So we don't need to fear man, but fear him that can kill body and soul in hell, according to Matthew 10, verse 28. So fear God more than you ever will fear what a man can do to you. Don't let man change your story. Don't let him change your faith and don't let him change your commitment to the Lord because we need all of these things for heaven to be our home when all is said and done. That's another reason why Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 32 and verse 33, that if we confess him before men, him will he confess before our father in heaven. But we, he that denies him before men, he will be denied before his father in heaven. So obviously then, that confession, yes, we do that before we're saved. Yeah, that's part of the plan of salvation. But we continue to do that throughout our entire lives because we should have not have one moment where we're ashamed of our faith in Jesus Christ and him being our Lord and Savior because that can be detrimental to our salvation when all is said and done. Okay. All right, continuing on. Again, as I repeat myself, we must always confess Jesus as the Son of God, which also means our Lord and Savior. We may face opposition when we make this statement, but it results in salvation if we remain this confession, remain, excuse me, if we re maintain this confession without being ashamed the rest of our lives, as we already talked about. And I paraphrase Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and verse number 30, 33 for us already. All right. So let's continue on. Any questions or comments before we move forward? Feel free to type them in and uh, if not, we'll move on. I'll give you a, a, a quick moment to do so. All right, let's continue on. John chapter 9, verse 28 and 29 then. Now, this is the response of the Jewish leadership, also known as the Pharisees, uh, to the man that now can see but was formerly blind as he received healing power from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All right. John chapter 9, verse 28 and 29 says, Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses, as for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. All right, let's move on. All right, so verse 28 and 29, we just read, so let's discuss them. Now, at this moment, the Pharisees are starting to begin to insult the man. That's what it means to revile him. They're starting to throw uh, insults at him at this time. You know, you can probably ask yourself, well, wow, they're really not acting holy at all, are they? And they're the religious leadership of the Jewish people. So now they're acting like the devil. Now they're insulting uh, the uh, man that was born blind, but now can see. Now, these Jewish leaderships now, they were adamant that they were followers of Moses while the formerly blind man was a follower of Jesus. 
Now, one thing that we can take home with us here regarding this lesson, anytime you're right and the devil um, no longer has anything intelligent to say, he'll resort to insults. OK, that's why if you've ever noticed that if you're in a, a, a good debate, a healthy debate, that when the opposition can no longer get their way or be convincing, now they attack people's character. You know, now they call them out of their name. Now they start lying and making up stuff. And so it's no different then as it is now. So that's one thing now I'm talking about and keep this in perspective when you're living righteously and saying the right thing. That's when you know you're doing the right thing, because now you're only telling the truth. And the truth in and of itself can stand on its own, okay? And that's when you know that Satan has nothing else to work with when he has to bring out all this negativity and get off topic from there. So obviously then, uh, they had no more ammunition uh, to work with. So that's when you, as we like to say here also, hold your mule. You know, that's when you're asking God, keep my temper down. You know, Lord, don't let me say or do anything that I regret. You know, just let me stand on the truth. And many times at this situation, sometimes you just need to be quiet. Don't say any more, you know, because the truth is going to stand on its own, on its own. You know, there are times where you're not going to be able to convince somebody of the truth because they've hardened their hearts uh, to the truth. You know, Jesus ran into this all the time, but deliver the truth. And many times now it's time to just leave it alone, you know, uh, from there. Now, let's move, move on, though. You know, the blind man eventually is going to have to do that. OK, Um Going back to the statement that uh, the Pharisees made, the Jewish leadership, again, they said in verse 29, we know that the, we know that God spake unto Moses, as for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. And they also said, uh, you are Jesus' follower, verse 28, but we are Moses' disciples, in other words, followers. All right, now, they could not truly be true followers of Moses, no matter what they claimed. If they were followers of Moses, I'm talking about the Jewish leadership, they would have been righteous in character. So obviously they didn't uh, act like Moses. So how could they truly be a follower of Moses? Okay, because the devilish um, ways uh, of dealing with this man are, are, are our parents and they started insulting him, etc. Okay, so obviously then they couldn't have been Moses followers because they didn't have Moses' character. Okay, they weren't righteous. Okay, all right. Also, they were, if they, excuse me, also, let me correct myself. If they were true followers of Moses, they would have also believed in Moses' words about the Messiah, which pointed to Jesus, right? No true follower of Moses can deny becoming a Christian. Why? When you look at Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, these are the words of Moses that he gave so that when the Messiah, also known as the Lord and Savior, arrived, they would be able to recognize him. Now, we went, went over this in the past. So I won't go very, very deep into it. But if these Jewish leadership was reading the Bible that they had at the time, they would have easily said, Jesus certainly is the Lord and Savior. They would have not have fought against him. They wouldn't have gone on smear campaigns. And they certainly would have not uh, delivered him to uh, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, for execution, execution because they would have been scared to uh, defy God. But if they'd have read their Bible, remember, they had the Hebrew Bible at the time, which we know as the Old Testament today. And Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15 in the Bible that they carried at that time said this. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. So obviously then, uh, Jesus fulfilled all of the characteristics that were just like Moses. Remember, Moses and God talked face to face. Jesus did that all the time. In fact, remember, Jesus was in heaven with God the Father. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 3 and verse 14, before he became flesh and, and lived on this planet. So he obviously talked to God the Father face to face, uh, just like Moses did. Uh, he was able to do miracles just like Moses did and beyond what Moses could do. Because remember, Moses didn't raise the dead, but Jesus did. Okay? Uh, Moses was able to part the Red Sea. Jesus was able to walk on the sea. Okay, so everything, if you think about it, everything that Moses did, Jesus did it even more so and even more powerful miracles than even Moses could have done, which shows us that he obviously is a son of God and beyond Moses. Okay, uh, but nonetheless, he's going to have characteristics like Moses. And, you know, one of the greatest things or actually the greatest thing, in my opinion, uh, is that Moses gave the law of Moses, Exodus chapter number 20, in other words, a word from God. Jesus gave us the entire New Testament, 
which is the word from God. And of course, Moses' words were taken and nailed to the cross. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, Hebrews 2, verse 24, and replaced with the New Testament that we have today, which is the covenant that God has us under called the New Testament. Okay, so obviously then that's very, very quick. We can we can go with more similarities between Jesus and Moses, but I think that's enough to show that if the Jewish leadership were really paying attention to the Bible and not going by their opinions or their pride or their jealousy, they would have easily recognized Jesus as the son of God, accepted him and not tried to betray Jesus as they did. OK, so again. Uh, one thing that was true from the Jewish leadership is that they were correct that God spoke unto Moses because the scrolls they had, which you call the Old Testament, were the recorded words from God unto Moses. That's the only thing they said that was actually correct. All right. However, remember, many of the Pharisees were lying also at the same time uh, by saying they did not know where Jesus came from. Now, they already they knew that. Uh, many of the many of them, which uh, is surprising to many of you, probably many of the Jewish leadership did know that Jesus was the Messiah, but they wanted his power and authority for themselves. That's why Jesus made it. We've looked at this in the past. I'll give you the reference where you can look at it again if you want, where Jesus talked about the parable of the farmers in Matthew chapter 21, verse 33 to 46 that killed the son that owned the vineyard. Uh, remember, that story was about uh, symbolism that. Um, uh, God the Father would send his son to them and they would kill him because they wanted power over the vineyard. The vineyard, remember, were the children of Israel. Okay, and that's why they crucified Jesus because they were jealous of his power and they wanted to remain in control of the Jewish people. But I received that didn't happen because you don't have them today. Where are the scribes and Pharisees today? They no longer exist. Okay, so God took care of that, you know, on his own. But also, he, God did even something even greater. He rose Jesus from the dead, and now Jesus is crowned King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And all of us will answer to him, even the ones that crucified him, will answer to him on the judgment day uh, to come. All right, any questions on that or, or comments before we move forward? We're making good progress tonight. I'll give you a few, few moments, and then we'll move forward if nothing. All right, we'll move forward then. Now let's go on down the chapter to John chapter 9, verse 30 to 34. And let me read that unto you in your hearing. Again, we're going to read the whole thing through and then we'll talk about it in detail shortly thereafter. If the good Lord sees fit. All right, the word of God says out of the King James Version. The man answered and said unto them, Why herein is a marvelous thing that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? Continue on with verse 33 and 34, and we'll study them. It says, If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. All right, look at that verses 30 and 31. Let's read it again just for a refresher and then we'll talk about it. It says, The man answered and said unto them, Why herein is a marvelous thing that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Now here, the blind man, or formerly blind man, I should say, was amazed by the statement the Pharisees made regarding them not knowing where Jesus came from. To the formerly blind man, Jesus' origin was clear. He had to have been sent from God to have the miracle working power that he possessed. Okay? So the blind man was basically saying in so many words, it's obvious. He has to be from God, otherwise he wouldn't have been able to heal my eyes, is what he's saying. So the reasoning a man was trying to convey to the Pharisees was that God could not work, work with sinful men. God was only working with men who were holy in his sight. So Jesus had to be no exception. He had to be a holy man sent from God to do the miracle that he just pulled off that the Pharisees could not deny. OK, because remember, the man was born blind and they just verified that through his parents. All right. 
So the blind man now, the formerly blind man that is, teaches us a biblical concept not well known today. The concept is that there is no such thing as a sinner's prayer. Okay, remember that's a popular teaching, but God don't hear sinners. You see, again, this is a false teaching in the world today. People believe that a prayer similar to the following would save them. Lord, I accept Jesus into my heart for salvation. I'm a sinner and need your salvation. Save me today. Well, these words or similar words are probably said with good intentions. Probably people meant well, but they will not save anyone. And this is because God said he's not going to hear a sinner's prayer. So if a sinner's prayer can't get through, then how can a sinner pray for salvation? Think about the logic here of what Jesus is teaching us. Or I shouldn't say Jesus, but the word of God is teaching us through the blind man. He was absolutely right because the rest of the Bible confirms this. You see, God will not hear a sinner's prayer. Prayer is reserved for those who are already Christians and not those seeking to be Christians. Those are two different statuses of people in God's sight and two different accesses to God. One has access. One does not have access to God. So one can pray and God will hear and one can pray and God will not hear. So only those that who are already Christians will get their prayer through to God that he will hear and respond. But those that are not Christians don't have this privilege. This is a privilege reserved for the Christian community as the word of God teaches us in this passage of scripture, but also another passage of scripture that I'm going to show you in a moment here. So again, John 9 verse 31 says, now we know that God heareth not sinners. What did you just read? God does not hear a sinner. So a sinner cannot pray, especially for salvation. Uh, the blind man said the truth. What did he say? Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Okay? A worshiper of God is a worshiper of God is somebody that already connected with God. That's the person that can pray. And the one that's doing his will, in other words, that's living in righteousness, that's the one that God will hear. And that's what the blind man revealed to us. These words for, uh, reserved for us to believe and obey so that we don't in error teach something that God does not teach. In other words, as we like to say, that's foreign to the Bible. The sinner's prayer of any type is foreign to the Bible for those who don't already have a relation with God, has already been a Christian prior to praying. So remember, sin prevents God from hearing anyone's prayer. That's what 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12 is talking about. It's teaching the same thing as John 9, verse 31 that we just read. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12 says what? For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. The righteous are Christians. You cannot become right until Jesus is the head of your life, until you're truly a Christian. So the Bible says what? The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. It didn't say the eyes of the Lord are over the sinners. If it did, then a sinner's prayer will work. And it says his ears are open unto their prayers. Who's are there? The righteous, which are also known as Christians. He says that his ears are open to theirs. It then says his ears are open unto the prayers of sinners who don't have a relationship with God. That's foreign again to the Bible. He says, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So those that are not righteous, God is not their friend at this point. So God is not listening unto them. Okay. So I know that's a hard truth. And I realize that that's, a, as we like to say, a hard pill to swallow. But the truth is the truth. We ought to stop telling people, you know, outside of Christ, those that are not Christians, that they can pray to God. They cannot pray to God. They cannot get through. The better thing to say is I'll pray for you because we have that relationship if we're living right that we can help them through prayer. OK, I hope that makes sense to you. And then on top of that, we ought to be sharing the word of God and showing them the plan of salvation, which we're going to talk about before the end of this, this uh, lesson, uh, so that they can get in, in Christ, so they can become a Christian, in other words, and pray for themselves. Because again, the Bible says, uh, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. In other words, one person's prayer is powerful to make things happen, so there's no power until one is in Christ, also known as being a Christian, also known as a child of God. Then that person has the power to pray and God will make that power activated in things that can happen that are supernatural. OK, but not until they're in Christ, do they have this Christian privilege in order to do so? OK. All right. So let's continue on then. 
just furthermore information that God has never heard a sinner's prayer. Okay. Uh, in other words, the Old Testament teaches the same thing as the New Testament. Remember, 1 Peter 3, verse 12 is the New Testament, the era which we live in. But even back then, in the Old Testament, before the crucifixion of Christ, God still wouldn't hear a sinner's prayer. Isaiah 59, verse 2 tells us that. It says, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will what? He will not hear. So from the very beginning, God is saying you have to have a relationship with me and you have to be living righteous for a prayer to open his ears and for him to respond to you. Okay, so again, it is not until one has been truly saved by obeying God's plan of salvation will he or she be, be declared righteous in God's sight, opening up the door for God to hear his or her prayer. All right. Any questions or comments on that? I'll give you a few few seconds here, and then we'll move on. As we're getting closer to closing out. All right, we'll move on. Let's go back to John chapter 9, verse 30 to verse 34. Now we're down at verse number 32. Let's read that again just to refresh our memory. Uh, the Bible says, Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. So again, the formerly blind man continues to reason with the Jewish leadership. Again, he was telling them that the healing power of Jesus made it obvious that he was a messenger from God. Unfortunately, many among the Jewish leadership were extremely stubborn. They saw a miracle they could not honestly deny, but still did not believe in the Lord Jesus as Christ, which means the Messiah. In other words, there were still many among their ranks that were still non-believers despite them uh, knowing that this great miracle had happened. Okay, so remember, you have a mixed crowd. Anytime Jesus went out there and taught, taught some uh, of God's word or did something miraculous, there was a mixed reaction. You had the unbelievers and you had a few that would, would believe. Okay, and you'll find out that later on in history, some of these Pharisees would become Christians. Okay, it obviously would have been a minority of them, but the majority of them rejected Jesus. Okay, all right. So moving on then, what the Pharisees did, in other words, the Jewish leadership, they kicked the man out of the synagogue. This again is what, called, what is called today excommunication. In other words, the formerly blind man became an outcast. He now was unable to worship anymore with the Jewish people at the synagogue, which again was the place of worship Okay, at the time, prior to the crucifixion of Jesus, as the time frame we're discussing in John chapter number 9 is. Okay. All right. Any questions or comments on that as we move forward? All right. Moving on to John chapter 9, verse 35 to 38. It reads as follows according to the King James Version. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. All right, let's look at these verses in a little more detail. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? Now, after the inter interrogation of the formerly blind man by the Jewish leadership was concluded, in other words, they stopped questioning him, Jesus approached the formerly blind man again. Now, Jesus, after hearing of his excommunication, uh, the Lord began to ask him about his faith in the Messiah. Remember, Messiah is nothing but a word for the Lord and Savior. Of course, the Messiah was also the Son of God. Okay, John 9, verse 35. Now, verse 36. Now, this is Jesus, you know, the guy, uh, gentleman, I should say, answering Jesus. In verse 36 and 37, he says, he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. Now at the time, the man did not know who the Son of God really was. Okay, he was honest. However, Jesus revealed to him that he was the Son of God. Okay, now this was unusual for Jesus in the New Testament. He rarely confessed to this fact bluntly to anybody at this point. But he decided to reveal to himself, I mean reveal that is, 
to the formerly blind man that he was the Messiah, the Savior of the Jewish people and all mankind, also known as the Son of God. Okay, one of the rare instances that he did that. All right, as a result of this conversation with Jesus and this miracle, the man believed and bowed down in worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, of course, this should have also been in response to the Pharisees after they heard of the healing of the man, but they were too stubborn to see their obvious truth. Unfortunately, a sad situation for them. Their hearts were too hard to accept the truth. Now, in the past, remember the man was physically blind, but the Pharisees now remained spiritually blind. The man, both, the man now was both physically and spiritually able to see while the Pharisees wanted to, de to deny the truth at all costs and continue to deny uh, throughout the earthly ministry of the Lord. Remember, all who do not believe in Jesus as a son of God are spiritually blind today, just like the Pharisees was. And these people that uh, do not believe in Jesus, they never will be saved without a faith in Jesus as the son of God, literally. Not that he's just a prophet, as Islam teaches, but no, that he is more than a prophet. He's more than a man that was sent with God's word. He is the son of God, which means that he is literally God's son and that he was sent to this earth to save us. If we don't believe these things, we cannot be saved. Okay. Remember, that's the entire purpose of the book of John. The entire book of John was written so that we come to the faith that Jesus is the Son of God, that saving faith. Without it, with, without it, that is, no man can be saved. This is what John the Apostle said, why the book was written. Look at John chapter 20, verse 31. It says, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing you might have life through his name. So you got to believe he's a Christ, which means the Messiah, the Lord and Savior. And that he is the son of God, that literally he is God's son. He is the offspring of the son, that he is the uh, child of Mary, but only the child of God. As Mary had a virginal birth, meaning God impregnated her. However, he did it miraculously and brought forth a son through her womb. Okay, you have to believe that, otherwise you can't be saved. So again, the book of John is designed to build faith in Jesus as the Son of God, which means the Lord and Savior of all mankind. Jesus would later say regarding faith in him as the Son of God in Mark 16, verse 6, uh, 15 and 16, that is. He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The gospel is basically that the Messiah has come and that there is salvation in him. And verse 16 says, when that is talked about Jesus being the Lord and Savior, here's a response of anybody that wants to be saved. Verse 16 says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So those Pharisees that won't believe, they will be damned. Damned means sent unto eternal punishment, judged for eternal punishment. That's all it means. But those that believe in Jesus and are baptized shall be saved. They're saved from the wrath of God, saved from eternal punishment, but will have heaven as their home instead. That's why John chapter 14, verse 1 and verse number 2 and verse, uh, verse number 6 are so powerful. And, and three of my favorite verses where Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. He said in that same chapter, John chapter 14, verse number six, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Okay? So we cannot be saved without Christ Jesus being our Lord and Savior. Jesus, Jesus also said, and he told the Jewish people this, and this principle also stands even today. In John chapter eight, verse 24, he said, I said, therefore unto you, that ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. So again, this is just reinforcing what we've are, we already know. No one will be saved without a faith in Jesus as the Lord and Savior, also known as the Messiah. If your heart has been moved to become a Christian for your salvation, please remain in this Bible class and we will go over God's plan of salvation according to the Bible and the Bible only before we conclude this class, if the Lord's will. All right, so I want to thank you here. We're going to go ahead and we're going to end 
um, our study in John chapter 9 here. And we'll pick it up on next week if the good Lord sees fit. All right. So again, we thank you for joining us as we have studied tonight. Uh, the Gospel of John, part 39. Jesus heals a blind man on the Sabbath, part three, which we concluded. Thanks be to the Lord. And of course, uh, we'll pick up a new topic next week. Uh, the next verses, in other words, go forward and study ahead of me. If you want to get some notes down for yourself, you can bring to class and ask them in class. And also remember, be Acts chapter number 17, Christians, as we have the example of the ancient Bereans that studied after Paul's teaching to make sure that it was so. And I'm saying study behind it in the word of God in and of itself. No preacher should be afraid that he is of you studying behind them. Because if they told the truth, then it can be verified in the Bible in and of itself. If it don't come from the Bible, it didn't come from God. And you need to flee that man's ministry and uh, flee those evil teachings because they will take you on to eternal punishment instead of eternal life. In other words, heaven won't be your home when all is said and done. But as I promised, let's take a moment to take a few uh, opportunities to share God's plan of salvation as it is written in the Bible and the Bible only. Uh, because that's the only thing that can save you. Uh, the Bible says that uh, in uh, regarding the plan of salvation, uh, starting with Romans 10, verse number 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That word is in John chapter 3, verse 16 and throughout the entire New Testament. But a good summary of it is in John 3, verse 16, where the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The third part of the plan of salvation after faith in Jesus as the son of God, which we stressed a lot tonight, is a lifestyle that we must uh, begin in order to be saved. And it's talking about forgiveness of our sins. Forgiveness of our sins comes before salvation. And Luke chapter 13, verse 3 and verse number 5, Acts 2, 38, and other passages of scripture show us that we must repent of our sinful lifestyle in order to be saved. That is, you are willing and able and committed up front to live the Christian life of righteousness and leave a sinful lifestyle alone. That's all repent basically means. After you repent, you must confess Jesus as the Son of God with your mouth. According to Romans 10, verse 9 and verse number 10, Acts 8, 37, and Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. And then you must, on the, uh, 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 the last part of the plan of salvation, that is, before you become a Christian, uh, go down to the watery grave of baptism in order to be saved. Baptism is where your sins are washed away, meaning that's when God forgives you. According to Acts 22, verse 16, that says, why tarryest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Baptism also puts you in Christ, which is another, word, another way of saying that you become a member of the church, which is the family of God, which is another word for you have become a Christian. Uh, you know that from Galatians 5 verse 27, where we're told that those have been baptized, Galatians 3 verse 27, excuse me, where the Bible tells us that those who have been baptized have been baptized into Christ. And lastly, baptism is where God decides to save you. So obviously he forgives you, he adds you to his family, and he saves you at that point. Because the Bible says in Mark 16, verse number 16, that you just read, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, he that believes not shall be damned. So the five parts of the plan of salvation, are, and I'm talking about to become a Christian initially, are to hear the word of God, believe it concerning Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess Jesus as the Son of God, and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and the salvation of your soul, are the five steps you must take in order to become a Christian. The sixth step is the one that we always take. In other words, Jesus tells the church, all of us that are already Christians, in Revelation 2, verse number 10, about our commitment level. Uh, he tells us, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. In other words, you have to continue believing and obeying Jesus to the end, and heaven will be your home. That's what Jesus means by being faithful unto him. And last but not least, for your child of God, that in your walk disorderly, if you've made a mistake, don't give up, don't give in, fight again. In other words, you can have the mercy and grace of God in your life once again, the forgiveness of God, and once again, the peace of relationship through him by the uh, mercy and compassion that's written for us in Acts 8, verse 22, and 1 John 1, 7, verse number 10, where the Bible tells a Christian that has fallen short to be restored to God's uh, uh, peaceful nature. Uh, let me say it right. To be restored to a relationship of peace with God once again. Uh, you must repent, confess your fault to him, and ask him to forgive you. He's going to do just that. Uh, don't forget, 
Again, we meet every uh, Sunday morning at 10 a.m. for worship service, and we would love to have you visit us when you're in the Northeast Alabama area. Our church building is located at 309 Henry Street in the city of Gadsden, Alabama, USA. 35901 is our zip code. And you can find our address and more information about the church and God's word on our website at www.henrystreetchurchofchrist.com. Also remember that we post our videos every day on uh, YouTube. So we ask you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Remember, you can find us by going to youtube.com, typing in either Henry Street Church of Christ or my name, Anthony L. Norwood. My name on uh, YouTube is Jesus is Lord, and you'll see my picture there. Um, we ask you to subscribe to the channel to get the notification when new videos are posted. And also uh, like and share the video so that you can share the word of God and also make these things more popular so that when YouTube does searches on certain topics, uh, the word of God will pop up in our website, or I should say our, our YouTube site will pop up and be able to help other people uh, out there in the world that need to know Christ, need to be encouraged, or need to be strengthened in Christ if you're a child of God uh, as well. Uh, so with that being said, we'll go ahead and I uh, wish you God's grace and peace upon all of your life here tonight. And again, we love you, but God loves you more. Pray for us as we pray for you. Uh, have a good night and thanks for joining us. We'll meet you again here at 7 p.m. Central Time on Facebook Live on next occasion. Again, worship service starts at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings at the Church of Christ uh, at Henry Street's uh, building as well. God bless you. Have a good night. Bye-bye.